Revelation of Praise, Revelation 14, 6 through 12. We begin after two, one, two. Angel, flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on earth and every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give the glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him in the heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up ever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and in his, his image, whosoever receive the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Praise God. Gracious, compassionate Heavenly Father, we invite your presence to be with us now as we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through the presence of your Holy Spirit, we believe that this worship period will be acceptable to you because you will come to abide and to worship with us. Bless us now, we pray, Lord, for we ask these blessings in Christ's precious and holy name. And the church says, Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. The task is mine this morning to welcome each and every one of us to church. I would like for all our visitors to stand, please. All our visitors. We are all about people, and every person who walks through this door is important to us. So as you welcome, as you visited us today, I hope you will have a blessed day. You may be seated. To all our regular members, what would church be without you today? It would be only the few visitors. So welcome and hope you will have a blessed day as today is our joint men and women ministry day. We just want to welcome you, and we have 
Brother and Sister Wheatley with us today. And I don't know if we have any other visitors that visit us, our regular members that visit us, but welcome, Brother and Sister, Brother and Sister Wheatley. Have a blessed day. Our opening hymn will be hymn 368. 368 <laughs> Scripture reading will be taken from St. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 3. When you find it, I'll read in your hearing. Amen, church. After these things, the Lord appointed and other seventy also, and to them too, and to before his face, and to every city and place, hither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest surely is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord, the Lord of heaven, who is not ye would send forth laborers unto the harvest. Go your ways behind, I will send you forth as lambs among wolves. Let us pray. 
Great God of heaven, we just want to give you thanks, Lord, for giving us the great opportunity to see another Sabbath day at rest. Our Lord, as we come into our courts, Lord, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here and giving us the strength, Lord, that we could come into your sanctuary today. Lord, as you know, today is, is men's and women's ministry day. And say, Lord, we ask you to be with us as members of that ministry. Help us to do the things that we have to do perfectly, dear Lord. And let others come and join us, dear Father. Lord, as we pray, we know many of us this morning are not well. But we are here, Lord. And we thank you for that opportunity as we bless you. As we enter another week, dear Lord, not knowing what to expect, we ask you, dear Lord, to guide us and to protect us and to keep us safe. Ask you to be with the manservant that is going to deliver your message of hope today, Lord. May deliver his message with clarity. And Lord, for those of us, dear Lord, we may open our hearts and receive your message that we might leave you a better person than when we came. Be back the forces of evil, Lord. Be back the forces of darkness and lead us into your marvelous light. Guide us and protect us throughout the week and beyond as we say thanks in your precious name. Amen. Amen. This time will be favored with a song from the main choral.
till my soul was on most gone. Long have sought for something better, only still to a girl. Satisfies my longing Through his blood I now am saved Oh, hallelujah Yeah, I have found him Oh, my soul So long I've prayed Jesus satisfies my longing Through his blood I now am saved Jesus satisfies my longing Through his blood I now am saved Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory. <laughs> At this time, we'll collect the tithes and offering. I'm going to ask that we ushers come forward, please. All the animals in the forest are mine and the cattle on thousands of hills. All the wild birds are mine, and all living things in the fields. Let the giving of thanks be your sacrifice to God, and give the Almighty all that you promise. Let us pray. Loving Father and our God, we thank you so much for your love and your mercy towards us. We thank you, Lord, for strength that you have afforded us so we could go and we could work that we will have that which you have asked us to return to you and to give a free will offering. Lord, we ask now that you will bless us and bless those who give and those who do not have to give. But most of all, Lord, help us to give of ourselves. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a, man, if a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in the proportion to the, his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. 
If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is in the leadership, if it is in le if it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Remember, sparse sowing, sparse re reaping. So bountifully, and you will reap bountifully. Each person should give as he has decided for himself. There should be no reluctance, no sense of compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. Bring the full tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing, he give thee but thine own. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. We go after two, one, two. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Whether they are black or white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Whether they are black or white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning, bigger boys and girls. So my story this morning is entitled, Lord, I Give You My Heart. Can we repeat the title, please? Lord, I Give You My Heart. Okay, so my story comes to us from the book of 1 Samuel. So we know that King David was considered to be a man after God's own heart and is most famous for defeating giant Goliath when he was just a shepherd boy. We all know of Goliath and David's story, right? The thing shot and the stone. So we know that when King Saul sinned in the eyes of God, he became displeased with him and commanded Samuel, his prophet, to anoint another man to be king after Saul. Now Samuel followed the directions of God and he was led to a man named Jesse. Now Jesse, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. 
and Jesse had eight sons, and David was his youngest son. Now, Samuel thought that surely the Lord would pick one of, you know, the bigger boys, strong, tough. They could fight, they could be king, they could slay any army. And he was surprised that God said to him, listen, I'm not looking on the outward appearance of these brothers. Not because they have, you know, a six pack and they are strong, they have muscles, they might be handsome. I don't want them to lead my people into battle. So now they were saying, okay, we have seen all the sons. Who is God going to pick? And God said to him, go and call the shepherd boy from the field. Now this shepherd boy was David. He was out in his field um, looking after his sheep and so on. So at this moment, there is a war going on between the Israelites and the Philistine. And the Israelites' biggest hero or their biggest strength was Goliath, which is the giant. And when David was chosen, he heard of the challenge that they had with, with Goliath. And he said that he was going to fight. And the king was worried. He was saying, how can a little boy like this, puny, no muscles, um, he doesn't look nothing like any of his brothers, how is he going to fight this big giant? So the king said, okay, he gave, his, gave him his armor and he saddled him up. However, the armor was too heavy for David, so he took the armor off, and he said, I'm just going to go with my slingshot, and two of these pretty stones that are found in the river. Now, everybody was worried, but guess what? David went in the name of God. He went and he took his slingshot, and he slung the slingshot, and hit the giant right in his forehead, and the giant was dead. Now, after the giant died, all the armies ran off because Goliath was their biggest strength. He was their only hero that they think could win the battle for them. Now, this morning, I told you the story because most time in life, as children growing up as young people, we tend to look on the outward appearance. We tend to say, okay, this girl is pretty or this boy is handsome, this boy is strong. But this morning, I'm telling you that God, he looks at the heart. So he only wishes for us to bring our heart to him. He doesn't look on the outward appearance. He doesn't need persons dressed in the fanciest clothes, in the best shoes, in the prettiest hairstyle. He only needs persons with a pure heart. So this morning, I encourage us to give our hearts to Jesus. Now, who wants to pray for us? <laughs> who wants to pray? All right, go ahead. Dear Lord, thank you for waking up us this morning, dear Lord. Thank you for food, thank you for shelter, dear Lord. Thank you for all you dear Thank you for all you done, dear Lord. Thank you for everything, dear Lord. In the precious name we pray, Amen. Today we have worshiping with us. On your right to my left in the second row, there's a beautiful little lady in a pretty floral dress. Sister Herman Walton. Sister Walton, could you please wave to the congregation? Brothers and sisters, Sister Herman Walton. Sister Walton is the wife of our speaker today. Dr. Lyndon Walton. I introduce Sister Walton to you because I believe I had a conversation with them this morning and, and in talking I realized that Sister Walton is the glue that helps God to keep Dr. Walton together. And they have been married for over 60 years. 
sorry, 50. I am pushing it. Over 50 years, but that is still wow, right? Yes, that is very wow. The union has produced four girls and two boys. Now, back in the day, long before many of us even started to come to church, Pastor Walton started out as Brother Walton in the Buff Bay District of Churches, a young pastor. And he had eight churches and three companies at that time to shepherd. After he had run his course in Buff Bay and he left Buff Bay and came to Kingston, he left 16 churches and three companies to the extent that the district had to be split in two. Then he came and he served in Kingston in the New Haven and Penwood churches. Later on, after completing his master's, he served at the Kencott SDA church where he assisted in raising up the Constant Spring Seventh-day Adventist church. I must also tell you that Pastor Walton served close to home because he was one of those called, during his time of called porting, he helped in the work that got the Bull Bay SDA church started. Then he went overseas and spent 17 years, right, doctor? 17 years after he completed his doctorate. And he served overseas, and before he left, he raised up the New Haven and Goshen SDA churches. Pastor Walton is retired now, but you see that during his time, he was a working pastor. And today, by his experience, he's here to share with us under the caption, Serving with a purpose. Pastor Walton is about, Dr. Walton is about to come and present God's words to us. But before Dr. Walton comes, the Harborview SDA Men's Chorale, and this is our disclaimer now, there are a number of our members who are sick. Both our choir directors are not here today. One is on conference duty and the other is sick. The rendition of Psalm 3 that we're about to do was divided into parts, but some of those people are not here today. It is easier for us to make do with what we have practiced than to try something else. So if it goes off, you understand we are working from a shell. After we are finished, Dr. Walton will give us the word. Amen. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down and I slept. I awake for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon their cheekbone. There was broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people.
Morning, everyone. Morning. Are you hearing me? Yes. Very good. Clear and loud. Yes. When we go into the majesty's, uh, majesty court, the judge says, silence in my court. But when we come to the house of God, we say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory. For there is no one else that needs our praise and our glory like the God of heaven and earth. Did God did something for you this week? What did he do? Gave you food? Yes, gave you clothes? And best of all, he gave you what? Life. And you bring that life today to come to do what? To praise him. <clears throat> so let no one take it away from you. Just praise the Lord. God is so great. Up to day, up to yesterday, I was knocked down with a fever. I don't know where it came from. But I spoke to my awesome God. And he, last night, after I slept, I woke up feeling fresh and ready to deliver his message to you. And so I'm glad today for the greatness of our Heavenly Father. I am the second generation my father was also a pastor. He served the East Jamaica Conference, and then he went on to serve the Central Conference. I want to say that because I don't want you to think that my father at that time is a still one here. Jesus has not raised the dead yet. So I am the second generation. And I am very pleased to be invited to this church today to praise the Lord and to share with you a message that he has given me. As I look around and it is habitual that as you go around to a new surroundings, you observe and you see certain things you can admire. Isn't that right? And I just want to say how many, many years ago, when I was in Kingston, New Haven, and Kencott, I think we had a workers meeting out here. And we had nothing like this resemble the Arborview Church. So I must commend you for the tremendous stride that you have made in putting up this fascinating building. And you know something? You have such a glorious vision that you make the church not just for the handful of you who are here today, but you envision that when the Holy Spirit, the latter rain, begins to fall, how many people who are now on the outside will come in and you know that you are going to need space for them and you build a building big enough to accommodate them. Very good. You have vision, you are wise. And I praise you for that. I want to say thanks to Pastor Smith, who is your uh, resident pastor. I knew him good friend of mine. I have the uh, worship at his church up in Augustown, where he came from. I also know Pastor Brown, a very long time friend of mine. And I might tell you that one Sabbath, Saturday night, we passed by, I don't know, remember what you were having, but with Pastor Cunningham, we passed by and we had even a little refreshment from you. So I don't want you to treat me like a new chick on the block. <laughs> Although I've never had the privilege of worshiping here or being your pastor, nevertheless, I consider myself a part of you, of God's people. What do you say? Yeah. 
So I'm extremely grateful to be here today. I want to say two things. One is a suggestion. When it comes to the midday, the divine hour is God's time. And all the songs and the prayers and whatever you might do there, nothing can take the place of this divine service. Therefore, no one should be outside or around the building, for this is the time when God wants to speak to all of us, and we should be inside to hear what God has to say to us. The next thing I would want to say, I want to congratulate you for selecting this young man as the first elder. What a tremendous young man he is. I sat down and I've been watching him and I've been listening to him. He doesn't know that. But I believe that God has laid his hand upon him. And I hope you will treat him good. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Treat him good. Because listen to me now. A first elder is hard to come by these days, you know. Very hard to come by. And when you find one, what do you think you should do with that one? You better hold on to him good. Yeah. Don't let him go. Now you have chosen service with a purpose. That is the theme of your message. Service without purpose. And I want to believe that this theme is very relevant and it is really to the point because for the condition and the seriousness and the situation that has fallen on the church we now God's church must have service and we must have it with a purpose. Because you will agree with me that the church has fallen into a, lot, a very serious condition. Lukewarm. You know what I mean. And so I think you have chosen a very great, great theme. Service with a purpose. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I come in your name. I am seeking your grace, for I have nothing in me that can commend me to you. And it is through Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit that I commend to you myself today and ask you for Christ's sake the message you have given me for these dear people please deliver it to them we pray in Jesus name if you I hope by now you have already slept have you? for now is not the time to sleep you must have slept already so please don't sleep on me because I have a message that God has given me to deliver to you. And I want you to listen to me very carefully for every word is chosen and it has a reason. Every word has a reason. Did you know that when Jesus came to earth, 2,000 years ago, there were two different and distinct people living on the earth. Did you know that? You know it. Very good. They were one, Gentiles. And two, they were Jews. So the two classes of people living on the earth when Jesus came, they were Gentiles. And they were Jews. 
the Gentiles were the larger group and lived in different geographical areas. By these different geographical areas, they bear their names. You remember the story of Babel? Or oh, they were trying to build a tower that when the rain comes again, the city would not be destroyed. And God came down confounding them. And they spread all over into different parts. At that time, it was known as the Eastern Hemisphere. The Western Hemisphere was not yet discovered. And so there were people, different people, in different areas, as I say, in different geographical areas. But they bear the same and one name, Gentiles. For example, Egypt were called Egyptians. All those who were born in Egypt were called Egyptians. And those who were born in Assyria were called Syrians. Those who were born in Moscow was called Russians. Those in Turkey was called Turks. And it goes on and on and on. And today when we are making reference of these people in these different geographical areas, we call them by their geographical name. But with God, they are Gentiles. Although the people bear the name of their geography, with God, they are Gentiles. I want you to understand that. Now then, bear with me, the breeze is a little rough up here. Why were they Gentiles? Or what is a Gentile? The Holman Bible Dictionary defines who is a Gentile. A Gentile is a person who is not part of God's chosen family. Are you there with me? A Gentile is a person who is not a part of God's chosen family at birth and thus can be considered a pagan. A Gentile is not of God's family and he is a pagan. I want you to take your Bibles now and turn to Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 and verses 11 and 12. And Paul describes who is a Gentile. Are you there yet? Please read for me. Yes, who can read loud? Let us hear it, brother. And you, yes. and you, hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature and the children of wrath, even as others. Verse 12. 11. Wherefore remember that he being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at the time he were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Thank you, my dear partner. Elder. So then, let's, time to, let's take time to look. A Gentile. 
was dead in trespasses and sin. He was unconverted. He was a sinner. Never knew anything of God. Secondly, he walked according to the course of this world. He was worldly. And he was without Christ. He was an alien from the commonwealth of Israel. He was a stranger from the common covenant of, of promise, having no hope. And he was without God. That is a Gentile, is that right? And that, of course, is more than color. Yes, that is more than color. This is what a Gentile is all about. Without Christ, having no hope. The second group of people, which are the Jews. bear a different name according to their belief. They are they are recorded according to their belief their record shows that they were Seven. Did you know that there were seven set of Jews? Yes, here are some. One was Pharisee. One was Sadducees. One was Zealots. Sekrakil. Essenes. And Herodian. All these were Jews. And they were called by the reason why they were given the name is because of their belief. There were some who did not believe in resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we find that the Jews believed and were constant constantly looking for the promised Messiah. They believed in, in the Messiah because they believe in Moses and they believe God that there were going to be a Messiah to come to relieve them from the Romanic oppression. And so they had a belief in the promised Messiah. Who would one day be born? The Messiah that they are thinking about is the one who would born from an aristocratic family. They were not looking for a Messiah who would appear on the scene with in a peasant young country girl born in a manger. No, that was not where their Messiah would come from. But their Messiah would come from a, an aristocratic family. He was to appear in the scene with power and majesty. Not from a peasant girl, country girl, as I said, or to be born in a manger. That was not where their Messiah was to be from. Through the preaching, through the preaching of Jesus, along with his ministry, of healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, feeding the hungry, 
raising the dead. An handful of Jews accepted him as the Savior. While the majority of the Jews criticized him, mocked him, and even put him to death. Because this could not be their Messiah. Paul, for example, was one who did not believe in Jesus Christ as the promised Messiah because he had in his mind that his Messiah was not an ordinary person. This Messiah must appear in human history with pomp and pride. And so he feared that this handful of Christian Jews who were going around and preaching that this little boy who was born would be the Messiah. Paul felt that they were doing something contrary to the belief of the traditional Jews. And so he was terrified in that he found, he went to the people there, the Sanhedrin, and acquired from them letters to destroy these people who were interrupting their desire. Because if this handful of people who now became Christian, if they were preaching and teaching that this Messiah has come, it means that what Paul and the traditional Jews longed for would have been interrupted. They would not have been. And therefore, he wanted to stop them in their track. He wanted to destroy them. And one day, as you remember the story quite well, he was on his way to Damascus with a letter from the Sanhedrin. He was given authority and power that he should capture all these little Jewish Christian people who is talking about the Messiah has come and throw them into prison so that their plans for this great Messiah would not be interrupted. So he was there. And he was a ringleader in the destruction of Stephen, you will recall. For when they were stoning Stephen, he stretched out his hands and he said, throw your coat on me, man. Throw the jacket here so that you might have more power to stone Stephen. So what we are saying here is the traditional EM Jews did not believe in Jesus Christ as the promised Messiah. They were still, even until this very day, they are looking for a child to be born in the Jewish nation to be called the what? Promised Messiah. And there, and so we find out that efforts are being made and they have what is called Jews for Christian, but they are following Sunday keeping the same way. And so what we notice here is that so as we have it, the Gentile on one hand, the Gentile were on one hand. They never knew God. They never had any hope. No promise was there. And then we had the Gentile that was, I mean the Jews that were split. The greater number of Jews still looking for the Messiah. While those who listened 
to the preaching and teaching of Jesus Christ, accepted him as the Messiah, and now became the what? Christian Jews. That's how Christianity started. So let me inform you before I go on any further that a Gentile is not reckoned by his color. A Gentile is not reckoned by where he lives in the ghetto. You can be a white Gentile and you can be a yellow as we are. People are having it to believe that Gentiles are black people. But in God's scheme of time, God sees a Gentile by his rejection of the promise that was made to him to redeem him from sin. For he was without Christ and Christ came to redeem him whether he born in Moscow, whether he born in Syria, were they born anywhere else as long as he did not accept Jesus Christ he's a Gentile and conversely if you're a black man and you have embraced Jesus Christ as your personal savior you are a Jew and you might want to call yourself a black Jew it doesn't matter to God for Paul has already told us that you are a Jew not by circumcision of the flesh by what but what by circumcision of the heart when we surrender our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and we accept him as our savior whether you be black white yellow pink or what? You are a child of God. You are a Jew. And the word of God goes on to tell us that salvation is of the what? Salvation is of the Jew. So here we are today. Here we are today. Black people here. And if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, if you are living under the blood and looking for its second repairing, you can very well call yourself a Jew. You may not live in Palestine. You may not live in Jerusalem. But in God's calculation, you are a Jew. For you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Bear with me a little. So, we are to say here, so, have we have one Gentile, yes, yes, you can have the same color. No wonder, no wonder, brethren, that Jesus was able to say, the way how his national people treated him, he was able to say that he came to his own, but his own received him not. But we must turn our attention to the handful of Jews who accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. That is where we must look now. With Holy Ghost power, they went forth to proclaim the risen Christ as a savior, not only of the Jews or the Gentile of the world. Here is a question that we want to ponder. What then the service has to do with Gentiles and the traditional Jew. Since your theme 
is of service and courage on purpose. Why are we taking all of this time to talk about Gentile and Jews? We are taking time now to think of the handful of people who accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior. For that is what made them who they are. What about them? What does it mean? What it has to do? Yes, because we have the greater number of the world population must be seen as Gentiles. And we notice that even the Jews who are geographically Jews born in Jerusalem and born in Jerusalem Palestine, they have not received Jesus Christ as their Savior. Therefore, I am to say to you that it is vitally important that this little group of people who accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and as their coming King, they have a tremendous responsibility and work to do. They have a work to do. It means that those of us who are Christian Jews, Christian Jews, don't be afraid to call yourself Christian Jews. For Jesus Christ is going to save you as a Jew. I hope you understand that. I don't care where you came from. I don't know what color you are. But as far as God is concerned, you are a Jew. And so, it means that those of us who are Christian Jews, and Christian Jews as I have already made it, it doesn't matter your color, it doesn't matter your education, it doesn't matter where you live, what your background is all about, as long as you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you are a Jew. And then only you receive the light of Christ's salvation. For only you accepted Christ as your savior. The handful of Christian people in Antioch, when they were not ashamed to stand up for Jesus, they were called Christians because they believe and they follow Jesus Christ as their savior. So they were called Christians, but they were Jews. And I want to say very categorically that it is upon us who accept Jesus Christ as our savior from sin. The responsibility is laid on us to warn the Gentiles and the traditional Jews. They must come alive and understand. There is a message to be proclaimed. Did you know that? You think we are going to just rock our way into heaven like that? No. There is a message to be proclaimed around the globe. It is the message of the second return of the Messiah who came here 2,000 years ago to redeem man from sin. His second return is to, again, to take place. But his second return is to reap the harvest that he had plowed soon before. That's what Jesus is coming for. You know, lots of us as Christian people only believe that Jesus is coming to take us to heaven. 
but Jesus is coming to reap the harvest of the earth and then we will be taken to heaven. God, how is this message to reach the globe? How is it going to reach the globe? The greater number of Jews are still waiting for the Messiah to come. The Gentile is there killing people and doing all sorts of things. They do not know about Christ. What is the handful of Christian Jews doing? God has a message that we must take to the world to tell the traditional Jews Jesus is coming again. To tell to the Gentile, get ready for the hour is growing late. What, who are we, who God has chosen to carry this message? Did you know that God has already appointed a people to carry the message? Already? God has appointed a people to carry the message. Do you know who those people are? I have a wonderful book here. You know, I'm not, I'm not accustomed to hold up mic in my hand. And that's why I'm having it so difficult. But there is, there is a group of people God has already chosen to carry this message to the world. You want to know who they are? I am reading this message to you from last day event. Who ever hear about this? Last day event. And it is page 45 and 46. The message of the Lord. Anybody here believe in the message of the Lord? Yes. Who believe in Ellen G. White? Oh, not many hands. Never heard about her, eh? Well, here. Hear what she says. The Lord has made us the depositaries of his law. He has committed to us sacred and eternal truth which is to be given to others in faithful warning, reproof, and encouragement. But she comes more clearly that none can mistake who God is talking about. And it says, Seventh-day Adventists has been chosen by God. A peculiar people. They are a separate people from the world. And by the great cleaver of truth, he, God, has cut them out of the quarry of the world and has brought them into the connection with himself. He has made them his representatives and has called them to be ambassadors for him in the last work of salvation. Who has God appointed? Oh, how many of you are Adventists out there? Let me, may, maybe, maybe I'm talking to some Baptist people here. Oh, just raise your hand. Is there any Adventist people here? Uh oh, there's much. There's much. So, those of you who raise your hand, you have a work to do in the church here. Now then, thank you. Since God has chosen the Seventh-day Adventist Church, those of you who have just raised your hand, it is you who God has appointed to carry this message. Did you understand that? Yes. In a special sense, she continues, Seventh-day Adventists, have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers 
to them that has been entrusted the last warning message. Seventh day Adventists. Are we still sleeping? Are we waking? Have we accepted this message? Adventist people, it is not the Baptist, it is not the Church of God, it is not the, the Roman Catholic, neither is it the Pentecostal. God names the church by name. The Seventh day Adventist church, you are responsible. God has already appointed you to carry the message to the Gentile world and to the traditional Jews who are still waiting for the coming Messiah. What are you going to do with this appointment? How are you going to handle this appointment? Brothers and sisters, you must understand the responsibility that comes upon us. We must understand what it means. And then, it doesn't matter what kind of Adventist you are. And when I say kind of Adventist, I mean physical. You could be a one-high Adventist. You could be a one-foot Adventist. You could be a, an Adventist that never had the privilege of going to school. Higher education doesn't matter. You might be an ad poor Adventist. God has already appointed you. You are written in God's book that your name is there. When you became a Seventh-day Adventist, God writes you down as his appointee to carry the message to the world. What are you going to do with it? So it doesn't matter. You know the Seventh-day Adventist church is what we would say is it is compre it is made up into different parts. And so none of us need to say, well, there is nothing. I want to do something for Jesus. I want to work, but there is nothing for me to do. None of you can say that. None of us can say it. Because the Adventist church is definitely broken up into different parts for service. You have the Sabbath school. You have the personal ministry. You have the prison ministry. You have the health ministry. You have the welfare. You have track distribution. Anything you want. Whether you went to school or were privileged to get education, it doesn't matter. God appoints you. And therefore, there is absolutely no excuse for you. And if you make an excuse, it will be a very sad story. Thank you. Yes, brother, this would be. Oh, God bless you, my brother. Yes. Yes, my brother. God bless you, sir. Yes. This is our way. This is our way. This is our way. God bless you. Just be with the brother as he fixes things for us. All right, thank you so much, my dear brother. God bless you, sir. God bless you. All right, so here we are now. Yes, this, are you hearing me? Those who are not hearing, raise your hand. You can't raise your hand because you're sleeping. No. 
All right. So then, I want you to understand this very serious message that we are doing to you. You cannot say to yourself, God knows that I want to do this and I want to do that. And I would be ready to do this and ready to do that. But God knows that I don't have the ability. It is wrong. When God brought you, the messenger Lord tells us that God does not bring into his church anyone who he knows that he cannot use. So if God brought you into his church to become a Seventh-day Adventist, then God sees something in you that he can use. And it is the devil's plan to help you to cast your eyes, not able to see what God can do for you. Do you understand as poor as you are, as uneducated as you are, as simple as you are, did you know that God has a work for you to do? Did you know that? Why not get it into your mind? The songwriter says, there is a what? A work. There is a plan. A work. There is a work in every worker. God has not called you to sit down. God has not called you to warm benches. God calls you because there are lots of work to be done. Begin first in your home. How you yard steer? Is everybody at yard know about Jesus Christ? Have you done everything for your husband, for your wife, for your children, for your brother, for your sister? Have you told them about Jesus and how if they do not surrender themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ, they are putting themselves in a serious position. Have you done that yet? And if you have not done it yet, when are you going to do it? Yes. There's a place for every worker in the vineyard of the Lord. There's a place. The woman in Canada had lost her two legs and she could not walk to go from house to house. So they gave her a wheelchair and they pushed her by the church. She sat at the front of the church and she had a handful of trucks. Did you hear me? A handful of trucks. And every person who passed by, what do you think she did? And them a track. Two legs. Had no legs to walk. But that did not prevent her from doing something for Jesus. And so, we all must do something for Christ. The disciples, are you hearing me? The disciples picked up the trail. Jesus took them one day. And he, as he came to the foot of the mountain, he said to them, before he shook hands with them, He held them and he said to them, I am going away now. But before I go, he said two things to them. One is go. And lots of Adventists now would work if people would come. But it's not what Jesus says. Jesus says you must what? You must go. And he says to go into all the world. Preach the message. 
And then he said, I want you to go to Jerusalem. I want you to stay there. Because the message that I am asking you to carry is not a message that you can of yourself do. You need power, greater power, to do this message. So go to Jerusalem, stay there, and I will send the Holy Spirit to give you the power that you will need. And so they did. And so the disciples carried the work of God forward. But they did what they could do. And when the time had come, they passed the button onto the new church. 126 people had gathered in Jerusalem. And they gathered there, wait for the Holy Spirit to come. And when the Holy Spirit came upon them, gave them power to carry the work. The reason why seven day Adventists are not doing more for God is because they are depending on themselves, depending on their education, and it is not working. You must depend on the Holy Spirit to do the work. So God, the button is passed on to us. We must carry the work to the ends. We must carry the work to the finishing line. For it is at that time that God promised to bless us. Then we must do the work with courage. And you know, as we find courage, love in doing God's work, God will do a thing for us beyond our understanding. May God help us then that as we understand that it's to us, God has given the message. May we ask God to help us to do the work that he has commissioned us to do. And in the end, is going to say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. We'll use for our closing hymn today the hymn 430. Joy by and by. Him 430. But there'll be joy when the work is done. Joy when the reapers gather home, bringing the sheaves at the set of the sun to the new Jerusalem. Joy by and by. Him 430. Yeah.
end of today's divine hour service. Just want to remind you that Bible class resumes, comes, resumes at 4 o'clock. We ask you to join us for Bible class. And then we will have our AY service at 5. And we invite especially the young people to be here for AY service when we will be discussing the Grand Lodge and Christianity. So it is important that you are here for that presentation. And as we prepare to leave church and to return, there are among us, there's among us a family that after they leave church today, we won't be seeing them for a while again. At this time, I invite the Dixon's family, please, to come forward as we pray God's continued mercy and blessing on them as they journey to another part of the world. I see Alison. Oh, I see Alison and I see Sharandi. So we'll pray with them. The blessings will extend to Brother Dixon. We want to wish for the Dixon's family the blessing of God. And just to remind Alison and Sharandi that when you go to that new place, Jesus is there also. And ensure that you still go to church. Many times our membership they go somewhere else and then after a time church has become a distant memory let me encourage you today please remember that the god in jamaica is the god who is in canada let us pray father we give you thanks for all you have done for us we give you thanks for the day that is we give you thanks for your provision and we give you thanks for your blessings and especially we want to place the Dixon's family in your hand today. And as they go now to join mother and wife, I just pray that your continued blessings will be on them and that, Lord, wherever they live, those around them will recognize that these are children of God who have the message of God for the times in which we live. Lord, I pray that they will be examples to those with whom they will rub shoulders. And for those of us who are here, oh God, I ask that you will continue to help us to not only be in a state of preparedness, but help us to be in a state of readiness, because we know that you are about to come. Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit will continue to guide today's proceedings. Go with us now where we shall go. Return with us now, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Dismiss us, Lord, with blessings, we pray.